afternoon and thank you for joining us. A series of gender-based violence have recently made headlines nationwide in Nigeria and beyond, sparking outrage even in the heat of the COVID-19 pandemic. More prominently, we have the case of Waila Mozua, a student at the University of Benin who was raped and killed on May 27th inside a church where she was studying. Just a few days after, we, are, we have of the case of Barakat Bello, a national diploma student at the Federal College of Animal and Production Technical, uh, sorry, Federal College of Animal and, Animal and Production Technology, rather, in Ibadan, where she met the same fate from the hands of rapists. Also, almost on a weekly basis, we have cases of rape, defiling, and all sorts of things like that. And it's a global issue. In Lagos alone, 330, 390 cases were recorded in one day, in, in March. And globally, this issue is still is, is a global issue, as I said earlier. Well, well, due to the lack of uh, um, red, uh, regular and adequate statistics in Nigeria, it depends on this, this, um, data from 2016, which is from the National Survey on Violence Against Children. This survey shows that six out of 10 children uh, have suffered some sort, of, some sort of physical, sexual, or emotional violence before they reach the age of 18. And according to the data as well, 70% of them are experiencing this violence repeatedly. Also, one out of two suffer physical violence, which will bring from various things, as you can see on the screen. The data also shows that one in four girls and one in 10, girls, in 10 boys experience sexual violence. Equally, one in five boys and one in six girls experience emotional violence. Mostly the perpetrators of all this violence against the children are people that they know. And in most cases, and they, act, they do these things in places where they are known, perhaps in their homes, in their schools, in their places of worship and all such places. As you can see on the screen, Various reports in recent times have showed that perpetrators could be anywhere. And for the majority of these children, they find it difficult to speak out. They, because of fear, shame, stigma, or lack of knowledge on where to seek help. Furthermore, in the data, there is, we, are, we see that 5% of all these children that experience various forms of violence get help. For, for reference purposes, we can refer to the to this national survey published in 2016. It's the joint work by the National Populations Commission, the United States Center for Disease Control, and UNICEF. In all these cases, all these children go up may grow up to start inflicting similar pains on other people. So that's where sex education comes in. Sex education is still largely regarded as something that should not be discussed in a conservative society because of religious and cultural um, reasons. They believe that when you teach young children about sex, through sex education, they tend to want to have sex. But studies have shown otherwise. In Nigeria, for example, the data, the researchers have found that the curriculum that increase that is that includes uh, sexual education, sex education rather, it would make give the students confidence not to want to engage in on um, on um, unwarranted sex and all sorts of things like that, and they will be able to control. Will be able to know when to refuse because they are already aware of their 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 well-being 
and what to do and what not to do. Ignoring sex education has accounted for increasing teenage pregnancy. And nationally, 29% is the national um, percentage of teenage pregnancy as of 2016. In some states, it's as high as 50. In some states, in some other states, more than 50%. So just that the national average is 29%, as just said. On the national scale, we have the National Comprehensive Sexuality Education Curriculum, which we rather call the Family Life and HIV Education Curriculum. Beyond the existence of this, uh, of this um, curriculum, the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act of 2000 and, uh, 2015 and the Child Rights Act of 2003 and other laws that we have in Nigeria are there to protect children against gender-based violence. But it's believed that with sexual, sex education, there will, be a, there will be a better way for children to be in a position to combat these heinous crimes committed against them. Good afternoon and welcome to the Edu Celeb Education Discourse. I'm Abdul Salam Amo. And joining us to discuss this, uh, we, first we have a research fellow at the Adolescent Health Unit at the Institute of Child Health University of Ibadan. That's a, at the College of Medicine in the University of Ibadan. We have Dr. Emmanuel Adebayo. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. We are, we are, we are also joined by doc, Dr. Oluwa Sheun Adewumi of the Stand to End Rape Initiative. So the duo will be joining us in carrying on with this conversation. Good afternoon, Dr. Adewumi. Good afternoon, Dr. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you for joining us. So I uh, was starting off with um, Dr. Adebayo. Sir, how did we get to the stage where we have to we are having cases of sexual harassment and others other sorts of violence against uh, gender-based violence rather? How do you get to that stage? Uh well to start with, uh I'll say that. Violence has been in the nature of men from the beginning. I mean, and when I say men now, I don't mean a particular gender. I'm talking about human beings generally. Um, if we look at the history of the world, one race has always exacted power over another race using violence. So I'd say it's the, it's, the violence has been part of us as humanity for a very long time. And it's, it just, it's one of our ways of expressing ourselves, really. And so when we say, how did we get here? Um, I think we have been here for a long time. We are just beginning to realize the detriments that these things are having on our health, the detriments these things are having on our persons as individuals. Hello? Hello? Can anybody hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I think you should, you can continue. I don't know. He went, he's not online. Oh, he went offline. Yeah. Um, okay, so I, I don't know. I think that was what I was going to answer to his question. He said that, how did all, he get here? All, all, all right. I sorry don't... sorry about that. I didn't know that I had uh, done something here. I've heard something here that removed me from the stream. So oh, okay. um, thank you very much for that. So to Dr. Sheung. What are the factors responsible for the various forms of 
um, gender-based violence. Sorry, I didn't hear. You said what are the... Various factors responsible for the various forms of gender-based violence. Oh, wow, that's like a very um, heavy question. But I will start by explaining what gender-based violence is so that at least people who can understand where um, it's coming from. So gender-based violence is actually is just violence directed at an individual, whether male or female, based on the person's biological sex or gender identity. And most times it's um, it could be physical, it could be sexual, it could be verbal, it could be emotional, and it could be psychological, like a psychological abuse, it could be psychological threats, could be psychological coercion. It can also be economic um, or educational deprivation. So, um, sorry, can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Proceed, sir. Huh? Proceed. Are you are you through? No. You said it could be psychological, <laughs> no, just... it could be sexual. We have that. Yeah. You are saying saying... emotional, it could be sexual, it could be a lot. And so, oh, okay. how can, how, why do people exhibit such? Why do people um, push out such? It could be due to a, due to power play. Like Dr. Adibayo mentioned, the fact that um, sometimes we express ourselves through violence. Mm -hmm. So it could be through power play. We want to show that we are stronger. We want to show that we are um, more intelligent. And so the only way we can express it is through violence. It could also be through culture. Okay, you know what? We've learned this over time. This is what we've done here. This is this is this is that. An example is um, female gender mutilation, and there are other examples like human trafficking and a lot of other things. But um, it can also be, um, like I said earlier, sexual manipulation. And in sexual manipulation, it could be more like um, an example of that can be maybe forced marriage, which can also be cultural. It could be early marriage, which can also be cultural. Too. So in the in the long run, there are, there are forms, there are examples of or rather forms of gender-based violence that I might not even have mentioned that you know that I know that I might not have mentioned. But the fact is that what is gender-based violence is what I have mentioned earlier, and then I've also given examples for it. So there might be other forms. And there might be things that might have caused those forms. Like, why are these people doing what they are doing? So, but most times, majorly, it's either through power play, which can lead to violence, or through cultural um, practices. That should be all. Thank you, thank you, sir. So, how can we prevent it? That question goes to Dr. Adibayo. What are the measures that should be put in place to prevent gender-based violence in, in all these ramifications? Um, thank you very much. Uh, so there have been, over the years, there have been different um, measures that have been put in place to fight or to, re to fight against um, gender-based violence. Um, to start with, I think women have um, suffered mostly from uh, the effects of gender-based violence. They have been victims for most of uh, this, and men have mostly been the perpetrators of gender-based violence. Although, on the other, on the flip side, there's some type of gender-based violence that men are more likely to be victims of. For example, when there is a war, um, and they are into tribal wars, men are more likely to be killed, while women are more likely to be raped. And all these are sort of uh, gender-based violence because men are killed because they are, the enemies feel it is if they allow the men to leave, they're the ones that will rise up to fight against them in future. And so they reduce their power by killing their men. But to say, how have we been able to combat this over the years? I'd start by saying one of the things we have done was when the human rights was instituted, to ensure that every single human being has a right to some basic things. And uh, in the rights also talked about the, the fact that no gender has power over the other and none is better than the other. So institutional laws and um, policies have been one way to fight um, gender-based violence. And another way to, that we have been able to fight or combat gender-based violence is through education. 
And that is why there was, um, in the past two decades, there have been several um, um, advocacy talking about the girl child education. And because it's believed that if you are informed, you are empowered. And so education has also been one way to fight gender-based violence. And then sex education has been also an important way to combat gender-based violence. Understanding that the truth is some of the gender-based violence that is perpetrated by people is what I like to call um, a wiring for most people. It's the way they are wired. In fact, a lot of men, the way they act is not it's not like premeditated or pre-thought. Some, some of them didn't even know they had it in them to do some things. It's just the way they were brought up, what they had been exposed to, what they had seen, what they had heard, even things that were not really said. It's what we see in our environment. You just grow up to see those things. And so you find out that a lot of this thing, this uh, um, people, a, a lot of times we perpetrate violence because it is what we are used to. And so education is key. And what um, gender-based, what sexuality education does is it gives opportunity um, for young people to actually get exposed to proper information as against what they are exposed to within their environment. So I'll say that these three things, among several other things, are ways we have in converting, converting gender-based violence um, over the years. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for that. So uh, I'll take the next question to um, Dr. Shion. We understand from what uh, Dr. Im uh, uh, Dr. Emmanuel, uh, Dr. Adibayo just said about the way people are wired. One of the one of the factors that people attribute to gender-based violence, especially sexual violence, is the, the sexualized society we live in today. You consider that as yeah. a factor. Or do you, or yes. what, what do you see about that? Let me just put it that way. Yeah, it's a very, it's a major factor, a very big factor. And then I can come from the angle of um, um, environmental, and I can come from the angle of um, genetic. But it will be more. I'll be, I'll be, fo I'll focus rather more on the fact that environmental actually plays a larger um, factor when it comes to um, focusing um, on sex sexual violence part of gender-based violence. And the reason why I would say that is that, um, like Dr. Adebayo said, he mentioned the fact that men have been more perpetrators of gender-based violence compared to women. And there are a lot of examples. There are examples like sexual harassment, examples like sexual assault, and um, examples like rape, and a lot of other things, like a, 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 a man coercing a lady, a man... Um, Harassing a lady, an example of such is either whistling or trying to um, be provocative when it is not wanted. Although I would not say that, that it is totally um, men that are perpetrators, but we all know and research has also shown that men are larger groups of the perpetrators. So if I'm going to be coming from the angle of environmental, what are these things that might have caused or that might, be, that might um, exhibit our prone to causing more perpetration of gender-based violence. An example is the fact that um, men are seen as the, as the tougher ones, the bigger ones, the ones that can take anything. Um, when we are meant to be emotional, when we're meant to speak out, when we're meant to talk, we, try, we tend to bottle our feelings in a lot. Some even tell us that boys will be boys. So one way or the other, when the ladies are being trained in that tone, um, have been taking care of, okay, you know what, you're meant to wash plates, you're meant to do this, you're meant to do that. Men are left alone to go outside to either play soccer and then return with their dirty shirt to, to, to allow their mothers or their sisters to wash the clothes for them. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually been a very big deal. And the reason why I gave that example is because there has been so much focus on the girl child when it comes to training and less focus on the boy child when it comes to training. And in a way, a lot of people might not see that as a very huge factor, but it's actually a very huge factor. So that's when it comes to environmental. There are other examples that I can give too. But when it comes to genetic, why I intentionally mentioned genetic is, I would also, in a way, want to introduce the fact that our mental health, one way or the other, can be affected. And why I'm saying that it can be affected is because um, one way or 
or the other. Like I, I was studying some articles some days ago. One way or the other, we all want to be loved. We all want to be validated. We all want to be respected. And so I would take us back to what the, um, Dr. Adibayo said about how sometimes our language is powerless. And so when we don't get that validation, when we don't get because we have not been trained on how to express ourselves. Sometimes we express it by seeking power, by oppressing other people, and so on and so forth. And so, um, yes, I think I think I said. What okay, I, I don't know whether you have more to add to that, Doctor Dibayo. Yeah, just to um, just to reemphasize all those points that um, really. I, what the, I think that the major thing that has perpetrated, that has um, sort of created a good and growing environment, creating environment for gender-based violence over the years, has been the environment, major. And uh, some of the things that have contributed to the environment is actually humanity. We have um, supported gender-based violence. We have uh, created an, an environment where it can thrive. For example, you find a woman who complained about how her in-laws violated her rights as a young wife will do the same thing to her own daughter-in-law. So it becomes a, a vicious cycle that just yeah. keeps going round and round. And so you find that it's majorly within the environment that we have some of this problem, and it's human. It's a human problem. It's something that has to do with who we are, how we are sort of set up, how we have built we we res it's the way we respond to things like i said earlier that violence is one of the ways we respond to our environment violence is one of the ways we respond to things around us and so you find out that the environment plays a huge role in the perpetration of gender-based violence if we look at what we had what we are talking about right now in the media talking about the girls that were recently raped and murdered you see that some of these things have existed until now because the environment had given them a good opportunity to breathe it's not like we are having a higher rate of rape these days. It's not as if we are having a higher rate of uh, gender-based violence these days. It's just that we are becoming more aware of the fact that this is wrong. Once upon a time, if something like that happened, a girl walks by and a guy slaps her in, in, the, uh, in the buttocks, people will say, oh, what a big deal, nothing happened. But because we are becoming more aware, thanks to education, again, because we are becoming more aware, we are beginning to speak out more about these things. What's the point in time? So what we are doing right now is we are killing the environment that has made this thing tried over the years. So if we can deal with the environment, which is um, which a lot of other factors are entrenched in, then we'll be able to curb um, gender-based violence in our societies. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, one, more, one more thing. Um, I feel like... You want to add something to that? Hello? Hello, can I continue? Okay, you have not, I thought you've concluded. Yeah, I just wanted to add one quick thing. Okay, add, add it, add it. Yeah, so I wanted to say that um, religion actually also plays, although it is within the environment, within society, it plays a, an important role in gender based violence. We find that. Um, a lot of our religions support the role of a man over a woman. And sometimes the, 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 this claim, this support has been extrapolated into several other things and has given uh, men in some instances undue um, power over women. And it has given women undue, in some other instances, undue power over men. And so you find out that once one gender is celebrated over the other in any issue, in any um aspect of life there is the potency of gender based violence in such situation thank you all right uh thank you very much so when 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 whenever we talk about all these things we look we consider the fate of the victim the victim of gender based violence how can we assist them to get help dr dr Shum? Okay, um, so I'm going to be a little bit more focused because we're talking more about sex education here. So the 
survivors of um, sex, sexual violence when it comes to gender violence. Yes. How come? Yes. Of course. Yes. I, I can't hear you. What did you say? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Oh, okay. How can we support them? What are the things we can do? What are the, um, what are the things we can also understand in trying to support them? There are actually a lot. One of the ways that, um, okay, I'm, I'm going to come from a solution for using the up down um, uh, method. And I'm going to be giving examples like um, the government. So when it comes to policy making, how can we make sure that perpetrators are punished? How can we make sure that the survivors are aired? How can we make sure that we can create an enabling environment for the survivors to be able to report cases so that one way or the other, we ought the cycle of assault, we ought the cycle of harassment, we ought the cycle of rape. Why, why I use the word we ought the cycle is that when a perpetrator arms someone and then that person reports that case to um, an authority, the authority finds out um, um, create an enabling environment where they are maybe are, let me use let me just use arrest they take they they, they they take charge of the situation they arrest the culprit and thereby they stop the culprit from affecting the person that reported the case um regularly and also affecting others so one way or the other they break the cycle so that's from maybe policy making and the government creating um, rules and regulations to be able to, and, and, and also implement regulations to be able to curb um, perpetration of violence. That's when it comes to policy. What about community? What are, the, what are we, the people, what, what can we do? An example is um, creating an, a non-governmental organization. An example of such organizations are um, Stand to End Rape, She Writes Women, um, Mentally Aware Nigeria Initiative, and a lot of other um, um, non-governmental organizations that help ladies to be able to report cases, that help men to be able to report um, cases, that help men or men to be able to go through the healing process and so on and so forth. Also, what are the community, what are examples of other um, community benefits that we can encourage? An example is what Dr. Adibayo said about religion. So in, in, the fact is that religious leaders can actually play a very, very huge role. The reason why I say that is that religious leaders are very influential. And so one way or the other, people can report to them. People can, um, we can, can respect them enough to be able to share their feelings and their fears with them. And so um, the point is that, um, like I've learned um, from various interactions I've had with people, I've realized that the focus of creating an enabling environment where we end rape, where we end sexual violence, where we end um, sexual harassment and a lot of other things is the fact that we need to focus on the survivors. We need to understand the survivors. We need to understand where the survivors are coming from. And one way or the other, that also will be able to, will be able to um, attack the cause of why perpetrators are the way they are. I, I, I think I'm, I'm done. I don't know if Dr. Nibai oh. wants to ask. Oh, all right. To... Um, thank you so much. So I would like uh, Dr. Adibai to talk about the, about the role of parents in this case. We understand that even in some of the cases shown earlier in the introductory state, in the introduction, we see that some parents are even involved in that. Just on Saturday, I heard that on, on a radio station in Ibada, they talked about a grandmother that was molesting the grandson. We have cases of father, I want, the one of father and daughter is very common. Father, father and stepdaughter was reported today uh, and yesterday in the news. Various cases like that. What is the role of parents in in um, preventing this uh, gender-based violence? Um, thank you very much. So, uh, if you permit me, before I um, answer that question, I'd like to say that at the government level, um, it's not just about policy uh, making. Implementation of the policy is very important. Um, if the policy is made and it's not impl implemented, it makes no difference. For example, when we talk about the VAP Act, it's, it has not been generally um, um, implemented across the country for the kind of uh, system we run. If the federal government proceeds something, the states have rights to either adopt or not adopt. It's all, even when they adopt, they're 
they don't totally adopt it. They adapt it in a way that they that best suits their population. So there are still states in Nigeria that have not implemented the Violence Against Persons Prevention Act. And this is these are some of the things we talk about. So the community can begin to push and advocate for the for uh, the we have a lot of policies in Nigeria that actually protect individuals. But then these policies are implemented. So on what rights do you want to stand on as an individual to make a statement or to make a difference? And so it's important that, as Dr. Shion talked about, um, CSOs and NGOs and um, yeah, all these organizations need to come together to actually begin to push for the implementation of these um, policies. For example, when we talk about the FLHG in Nigeria, it was a couple of organizations that came together in 2001, 2002, and began to advocate for the implementation of sexuality education in Nigeria before it was finally implemented in 2003. And these organizations kept advocating for these things and they are still advocating till date for sexuality education in Nigeria. So I believe that it's important to push for these things. And then when we come back, come down to the, the family, sometimes the family rides on two, two um, platforms. The first is the community platform, and then the government platform. The family, the family is the smallest unity, the unit, sorry, the from, from smallest unit in um, a community or in the, um, in the country as a whole. So if we have a family stand up against a particular thing, if I talk to my children, I talk to my son, I talk to my daughter, and I educate them about GBV, and tell and protect them from GBV, and every other family does the same thing, then we will have a good um, society. Recently, my um, department in, at the College of Medicine did a um, study where we looked at um, parents and helping them communicate sexual issues with their adolescents. One of the problems we have is parents find it difficult to communicate uh, sexual issues with their adolescents. All you hear them say is things like, you talk to a guy, you say things like, eh, be careful. You talk to a girl, you're saying, don't let a guy touch your pants. What does that mean? Don't let a guy see your pants. What does what does that mean? But a lot of times, parents are on their, they don't have the skill or the power to talk to their children. And so what we did in that study was to help parents uh, develop the skill to talk to their children about, um, about sexual issues. A report across 25 countries um, last year, two years ago, 25 countries, including Nigeria, showed that parents were actually asking for help, that they don't know how to help their children. They know they want to help their children. They know what to do, but they just don't know how to do it. They know, I should talk to my child about this. I should tell my child this. I should tell my child that. I want to protect my child, but they honestly don't know how to go about it. Unfortunately, you find out that the schools... So teachers at school have now been bored with all the things parents should be involved in. We keep talking about sexuality education in school, which is very good, but then we should start from the home. Sexuality education should start from home, then to school. But most times a child is hearing something different at school and is hearing something different at home. It leaves the child confused. What, who is he supposed to listen to, the parents or the child? And so we have to balance this. As we do sexuality education in school, there has to be sexuality education at home. And it should ideally start from the house before it gets to the school. So, and that takes me to the next question of age appropriateness. So we understand all these things we talk about uh, in the need to, on the need to include, uh, include uh, sexual, sex, edu sex education or sexuality education as some people call it. In the curriculum, it has already been it has already been included and integrated into it in various in various ways. They put it in English passages. They put it in um, in social studies and other and not on such uh, social science subjects. So, how can we ensure age appropriateness in the teaching of these things? So, I want you to answer that again, sir. Okay. Before um, I come back to Dr. Shirley. Okay. Thank you very much. So about age appropriateness, uh, this, this is actually an international, it's a global issue. Every parent across the world is asking that question. What do I tell my child at a certain age? I mean, how do I, how am I sure that this information is not too much for this child? The first thing is to understand is, sorry, going back to the sexuality education um, curriculum that we use in Nigeria, FLHE currently, 
FLHE was actually originally not designed to be gender sensitive at all. The current FLHE that we do use in school is not gender sensitive. However, studies have found out that even though it's not gender sensitive, it has been very useful in changing gender ideas that young people have. It has changed gender ideas, it has changed gender attitude, it has changed gender perceptions among young boys and young girls that have been exposed to the curriculum. Imagine what happens when we now have a curriculum that is exactly gender sensitive. Because FLH was originally designed to combat HIV, not to combat gender-based violence. But gender-based violence has found its way into it because it's part of the things young people face. But imagine we have a curriculum that actually deals with, that, is, that incorporates um, gender issues into it. It would, it would actually provide us with more and better results. But to go straight to your question about, um, to your question rather, about um, age appropriateness, UNESCO has uh, a guideline that it uses to provide gender. So a couple of us globally have come together and they have um, come up with a um, list of ideas of um, um, topics that are appropriate for a child at a certain age, right from the age of five, actually. So there's a, in the curriculum, they have what is appropriate for each child at, as they develop, as they grow. And what I would say to most people is that uh, just follow that, that um, curriculum because it has been well-researched and globally it's been found to be very effective in providing what is gender, um, what is appropriate for each age at each point in time. All right. So I would, I would like, I would like a Dr. Adewumi to add more to that. Okay, I think you have said everything actually. But what I just want to add is that a lot of people argue that um, teaching their children or educating their children on sex and sexuality terminologies can encourage them to, to start having sexual intercourses and start doing sexual practices. But that is not true. Um, it is actually their right to be educated so that when they really need the tools, they would not be found wanting. It's actually very simple. And like what Dr. Di, um, Dr. Dibayo mentioned, the fact that people have actually come together, example, UNESCO and UN, UNFPA and a lot of other um, CSOs and NGO bodies to try to work on a framework that will be able to answer the questions of a five-year-old, the questions of a six-year-old, the question of a seven and on and on, to be able to answer their questions when it comes to sex, uh, sex education to be able to also give them tools that they can okay. use, to be able to also understand if their mind can understand what they have been taught. So we need to come to a point to actually understand that sex education is paramount. Sex ed education can, can, can um, how will I put it? Can help in decision making when it comes to sexual um, um, activities and like um, when we when we first started when the presentation was going on I noted some things down the fact that 20 25 percent of children also experience physical violence and 30 percent of them experience emotional violence so one way or the other you can't take them out of the equation you need to teach them you need to educate them when it comes to sexual um, sexual um, sex education and these children will also grow up um and become adults like us so one way or the other they need to be taught we all we also need to be taught every one of us and so sex education doesn't people people feel like sex education will encourage their small small children or their rather small their children at home um encourage them to engage in sexual activities but that is not true research has shown that it actually helps them to be able to combat to be able to use tools useful tools that they might have learned in school useful tools that they might even have learned at home Unfortunately, like Dr. Ribeiro said, most parents don't know how to teach their children when it comes to sex education. So I think that's what I'm going to add. Right. So what should a victim do? A victim of um, sexual violence or any other sort of um, gender-based violence, what should that person do in any instance? So it might be a boy or a girl, either way. So I would like a Dr. Ribeiro to answer that question. So, so, what should a victim, victim, yeah. so, so, okay. so uh, what should a victim do? I think the first thing, which is one thing we have been trying to fight for over the years, is 
create an environment that would accept the person and not um, judge the person. I mean, you find that a lot of times, um, a common example, using a girl that has just been raped, you, she gets to the hospital or she gets to the um, police station where she goes to read and asking her questions like, what were you wearing? Why did you go to that place? Why did you pass through that place? Um, if you didn't want it, why did you go there? I mean, th those kind of questions are just blaming the victim. And so the first thing I would say is talk to the, com is to the community that we need to get an environment that can help people because that's the only way we can encourage them to now speak forth because what, we, what you need to do if you have been a victim is speak. Seek for help. I mean, and the help is not just uh, it's not just um, help against the person to punish the person who has um, perpetrated it. It's important to punish the perpetrator, yes, to ensure that they don't do it again. But then, most importantly, for the victim, it is the fact that that victim needs help. It needs health and um, help health wise. Needs psychological help. Needs counselling, and then they need a supportive environment. People that would um, gather around them and um, show them that they truly understand what they're going through or support them in what they're going through. Not people that would um, ask them very um, annoying questions that make them look, that blames them for what has happened to them. I don't think there's any other, any girl that would want to be raped. I don't think there's any guy that would want to be raped, that would leave their house saying, oh, I think I want to go and be raped. No. So you can't blame someone who has just gone through um, um, abuse that it's their fault they were blamed so we need to create an environment that encourages them to speak forth but to the person directly i would say speak out the, the government of nigeria currently is actually doing a lot to reduce um uh violence against individuals I mean, an example is the VAP act that was just um, um enacted last year and um also we can see states like um uh, or your states, uh, legal states, implementing policies that actually punish um, those who perpetrate violence. So please, the, the community is on your, your side right now. You have a lot more on your side than you did five years ago, than you even did two years ago. So my advice to anyone who has been a victim would be that please speak out, find help, seek for help, look for support. You need counseling. You need help. Uh, check up anything you need you will get but please you need to speak out if you don't speak out you will never get the help you need and you require thank you all right thank you thank you so much for that so the next the next uh, question goes to dr Adewumi. so considering the so considering the fact that you have been engaged in advocacy what are the gaps you see in all these advocacy movements in fighting and, and gender-based violence all over the world, all over, like specifically from the Nigerian experience, what are the gaps in advocacy in against um, gender-based violence? Yeah, um, the first thing I would say is that I would say that an, av an advocacy was created because there was a loophole in um, the government structure as regards anything. And advocacy is always created because there's a loophole in, a, in the government structure. If there's no loophole in the government structure, advocacies might not be created. Having said that, when it comes to working with Stand to End Rape initiative, I've realized that there are a lot of things that we are doing and it doesn't, it doesn't, we don't just focus um, solely on the survival, mm -hmm. but majorly our focus is on the survival. And like Dr. Adebayo said, one of the things we um, encourage and one of the things we tell survivors is that they need to speak out. They need to speak out. It is not basically to speak out for the perpetrators to be punished. It is actually more to speak out so that you can get the help you really need, so that you can be less vulnerable to harassment in the future, so that you can be less vulnerable to coercion in the, in the future, so that you can be less um, vulnerable to rape in the future. But as regards other things apart from the survival, one of the things is um, advocating for implementation of views, advocating, advocating for implementation of policies that will be able to protect the survivors, that will be able to punish the perpetrators, that will be able to um, strictly educate the 
um, general populace on how to um, avoid triggers, how to help themselves, strictly create policies that also we advocate for sex education to be taught, not just in secondary schools, not just in universities, but also in um, at home, like Dr. Adebayo has said. So it's, a, it's, a, it's more of a multifactorial um, effect. And one of the things I've also noticed is that the, help of, the use of social media has really helped. Like Dr. Adebayo said, he said something that really, um, um, that I really, really agree to when he said that it's not that um, there has been more uh, rape activities out there. It's not that there have been more sexual harassment out there. It's not that there have been more um, a lot like reports of um, sexual violence out, out there. It's just that because there's an advent for people to be able to speak out, there's a tool for you to be able to report things. People are getting to know more. People are getting to see things more. People are getting to understand that, wow, this thing is actually uh, more evident than we think. It's not like it's, 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 it's on the ice, or rather it's on the ice side, but it's not that it's increasing. So another thing that I realized that non-governmental organizations do uh, and advocacy groups do is they help um, survivors when it comes to social media uh, appropriation, where a survivor can easily report, like your phone, you're just a phone away to reporting an incident. To and help you through the process, and that way, it's it makes reporting easier. It makes people actually coming out easier, one way or the other. So, when it comes to advocacy group and sex sexual violence, I I, I think that there's more there's more that we have now than before, and that in itself is a good um, um, development. All right, uh, thank you so much for that for that uh, insight given on the on the subject of. On, on gender-based violence. So moving on, I would like, I would just, uh, before we conclude this, I would like um, Dr. Adewumi, from your experience, you know, we understand that all this, all this, um, advoc all the, uh, a lot of advocacy, and we've seen, um, from what uh, Dr. Adewumi just said, people are doing a lot on social media. But in all this, we have also seen cases where people falsely accuse people, other people of uh, sexual harassment and other things like that, or other forms of gender-based violence. How do we work around all this in ensuring credibility of, of uh, reports of victims? Yeah, so um, before I continue, I would also want to um, step a, a little bit back to mention the fact that um, consent so a lot of people don't understand consent. Men don't understand consent. Even women themselves don't understand, understand consent. And so one of the first things that um, I get to tell people is that oh, um, believe, um, always believe the story of a survivor until otherwise proven. Reason why is because if you don't believe, and unfortunately it is true, one way or the other, you have victimized the survivor. And... Um, so let's talk about um, false allegations. How can we combat false allegations? How can we make sure that people are not falsely accused? And how can we encourage people to actually speak out? It's actually a very dicey uh, situation. But one thing that if a survivor goes to um, social media now to report a case to stay, that stand to end rape initiative, the first thing start to end rape initiative will tell such survivor when it comes to um, avoiding um, sexual allegations that might not be true is that you need evidence. You need evidence to be able to report so, 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 and so. Now, evidence differs. Um, the, 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 the more recent the assault is, the, easy, um, the, the, the easier it is to get evidence. So evidence differs, but evidence can be, can, can be from maybe body range in a way that, okay, you were just sexually harassed, you still have um, some um, marks on your body, you still have um, um, the semen of the person in your vagina and a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. Or you have recordings, you have um, pictures, you have chats that you've kept, screenshots that you've had, um, conversations that you might have had with the person that you've recorded. So there are a lot of evidence. So you, you, you can't call someone out and not have evidence for it. So that's, and, and that's one of the easy, very easy ways to be able to combat um, false sexual allegations. I don't know if I answered the question. 
Oh, you, trying to you, are, you, you are, you are. So I would like, a, I would like a Dr. Adebayo to come in now to add more to that and also to speak about this issue of cases of sexual element of boys. How do how as a, in his, uh, in your line of um, your in your line of uh, work how have you been how have you been able to establish cases of boy child harassment? Um, so I'll start by saying that I I am not really on the field. I am a researcher, and so I am mostly um, working um, mostly working on my laptop. Um, however, I, ha I am in touch with people who are on the field and we work closely with organizations who do field work and with, um, all, with um, NGOs and CSOs who actually help victims. And I'll say that uh, it's with the issue of, um, just like Dr. Shion said, it's a very dicey issue to talk about the false allegation because most times the it's easier to believe the victim and sometimes as, as dr shion said it's safer to believe the victim and the victim is mostly believed until otherwise proven uh, so like you also said evidence move uh, differ from one situation to the other however however these um uh evidences are also very difficult to come across in in some situations and we have I had we have read about cases of people who were falsely um, accused and who went to jail for something they didn't do. It's it's an issue that we will keep having to deal with. Um, to talk about rape among boys or sexual violence among boys, the interesting thing is up until recently, when the VAP Act was uh, instituted, it was the, according to our for our laws in Nigeria, it was almost impossible for a male to be raped. Because there was nothing, if you check the laws, there was nothing against the perpetrator. There was no laws against the perpetrator of a male victim, uh, sorry, the perpetrator of a male rape. And so I would say that we are working, we are moving gradually in the right direction because the new, the new Violence Against Persons um, Prohibition Act has um, also put into consideration that males also get raped. And in my experience of seeing uh, young boys get raped, what we have found in research is most boys find it more difficult to speak out as compared to girls. If you have three, if you have ten boys and girls who get um, raped, you are more likely to find five girls come out to say that they were raped, and you are among ten boys, you are more likely to see one or two come out to say they were raped. So you find out that that the, the gender issues still come to play, masculinity, like how do I and say I was raped? I've actually spoken with a boy who said when he reported that he was raped, um, he, the police asked him, are you sure he did not enjoy it? I mean, how mm. can you as a guy be raped? It's not possible for you to be raped. So some of the issues that we that boys face um, when it comes to rape also gather around gender issues, around masculinities, expectations of masculinities, and all those things. But then I, I'd say that we are, we are moving gradually towards um, getting better in those areas, although slowly uh, behind a couple of other countries in the world, but then we are, we are moving, we're better than where we were um, two years ago. Uh, to also say that um, when we talk about boys being raped or being sexually assaulted, they usually require more mental health support. Well, uh, let me not say more. They usually require a lot of mental health support because of the ideologies of masculinities that they carry. It's like you have emasculated a man when you rape him, especially when it's another man that has raped another man. You find out that in, in countries where they've had um, ethnic wars, a lot of men were raped by other men. And it was an idea, it was a way to emasculate them, to take out their quote unquote dignities as men. So there's a lot of uh, underlining issues that actually affect a boy when they get raped. And all these things are not yet fully addressed in our policies. All these things are not yet fully addressed, even our intervention. When you look around you, there are very few interventions that talk to boys about rape. They talk to boys about not being a rapist. They don't talk to them about being raped because most people still look at boys as the perpetrators. 
are not victims themselves. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, thank, thank you, sir. I'm talking about um, um, victim. Work. So, okay, talking about victim, would we understand from the statistics just as those as noted earlier? One in one in four girls in the in the reports from 2016 from the done by the National Populations Commission in conjunction with some foreign partners, including the um, United Nations and Children Fund. Found that one in four one in four girls uh, re reported cases of sexual uh, harassment, and for for boys is one in ten that that reported similar thing. And this people the um, that was when they were under mm -hmm. eighteen. So, how do we encourage these boys to speak out? We know that almost all of these advocacies have been have been focused on girl the girl child girl the boys the I mean the men are the um, perpetrators and all that. So how do we encourage the boy child to speak up in terms of all these um, violations? So I would like Dr. Sheung to speak about that. Okay, um, I think the focus here should be psychosocial support. And the reason why I mentioned psycho psychosocial support just means psychological and um, social. <laughs> okay, let me make it um, psychological, like the mind, and sociological, the interaction between um, a man to a man or the interaction between a man to a woman or the interaction of the, um, between a, man, a woman to a woman and vice versa and the reason why psychosocial support is very important like dr adebayo said is the fact that a lot of men when it comes to masculinity we are we have been taught to be toxic and why i said we've been taught to be toxic is because most times we are told that we are strong we are told that we are we are weak when we cry. We are told that we should not report. Like we should try to find the solution by ourselves, for ourselves, and so on and so forth. And so, um, research is also um, querying the fact that if if men are not coming out to speak enough, that means the one in ten might actually be even more. Just like some women are not coming out to even speak to, and so there might be more perpetration of um, of victimhood when it comes to men than what we have now. The fact is, why am I mentioning psychosocial support? Psychosocial support helps in a way that it puts, um, now we're focusing on the girl child, we're focusing on the man. So let me just talk about the man because I, I've been trying to be gender neutral, but since we're mentioning the man. So it puts the man in a place to encourage the man to, to own up to his personality. Now his personality is not a personality that encourages um, 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 accepting the trauma that has happened to you and not talking about it that encourages you to um, follow your pain and not actually express it and so on and so forth. What psychosocial support does is it just encourages you to be able to talk to uh, people about your pain, talk to people about your issues and be able to heal through the process. An example is a, um, let's say a boy not up to 19 was raped in school by a male teacher. And the boy keeps it to himself, goes home. Unfortunately, like Dr. Adebayo has said, he mentioned the fact that um, most families don't know how to um, talk to their children. The fact that this boy cannot talk to his, to his parents about what might have happened in school because maybe he had a fight with his father some days ago and he had a fight with his mother some few days ago too. And then apart from that, his father, has taught him how to be strong, how to withstand pain. And people don't understand that teaching people how to be strong, how to withstand pain is not, is not teaching them not to talk about it. Talking about it actually is one of the ways to be able to stand pain. Now I'm using pain as a colloqu as a um, as a an, as an umbrella for everything that might be in between. And so this boy keeps this thing to himself and he keeps blaming himself. Now he realizes that he's um, his academic is failing. Why? Because he's no more interested in going to school. And apart from that, he's not interested in going to the class again because this man has done this and this to him. And so his academic is failing. He's keeping it to himself. He's bottling it up. And one way or the other, he also wants to express himself. And so he feels like the way he can express himself is by uh, perpetrating violence too, and finding sexual gratification by, um, by going on the street and finding wherever he can find and harassing us and um, sexually assaulting them and so he does that and one way or the other he finds that that gives him a little bit of power but what he doesn't know that that's 
not power. It's actually more of oppression. You're oppressing another person. And so it keeps doing that for a very long time. But what should have happened? What should have stopped him from doing that at all? Or even if he, keep, he kept doing that for a long time, how can he get the help he needs? How can he come out to talk about it? That's where psychosocial support comes in. And so the solution to men being able to talk out is majorly psychosocial support. But how can we infuse psychosocial support into our daily activities, apart from the boy actually going to see a therapist or the boy actually going to see a social worker? One of the things is encouraging the um, 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 and encouraging parents to be able to listen to their children, encouraging parents to be able to teach their children about sex education and so on and so forth. So it's actually a cycle. It's more like, it's not a straightforward answer. It's more like all the things that we've been saying from the very beginning of this um, of this conversation till now. So I don't know if I answered the question, but I, I feel like Dr. Dubayo might have um, some other things to add. Dr. Dubayo? Yes, please. And um, would you like to add something mm -hmm. to that? It's just one thing that um, I feel like if we have for boys, um, so there are a couple of people who feel like boys are privileged over girls because boys are allowed to go and play while girls stay at home with their parents. I would say that girls being at home with their parents has actually been protective for, for women over the years in some things. It has exposed them to, um, we talk about women being able to multitask. We talk about women, women being better managers. It's because of some of the exposure they have in their own front that guys are not exposed to. So I would say that females are better able to um, handle emotional troubles sometimes more than males because of the exposure they have at their own front also. So what I would say is boys need more of what girls have right now. Boys need more of that stay at home, hang out with your mother, hang out with your father, as the girls have it. If they have that, if they have that kind of um, opportunity, if they have that kind of um, exposure like the girls, then they might also be protected from some of these um, violence that we're, we're talking about. Even some of the masculine um, um, risks that they take, they might be, um, safe or secured or um, protected from some of these acts. I'll say a brief story. I remember a couple of years ago um, in, a, in a state in the South South, I was there, um, we were hosting a, a sexual reproductive health camp for young boys and girls. And we had this guy come in from Abuja. He was supposed to come and help with some of the activities on the camp. And while we were there, we realized that a couple of the young boys, I mean, I'm talking about boys between the ages of 10 and 12, were spending a long time in the toilets together. And so one day we decided to know what was happening and we found one boy, a 12 year old, an 11 year old boy masturbating in the toilet. And it was very worrisome. Like what happened? What, what exposed you to this at this young age? And so of course we tried to talk to him, he refused to talk. And so we let him be. But then we started watching him from then, only to discover that the guy that had flown in from Abuja had actually been trying to molest the boys in the hostel at night. Mm -hmm. So he would invite the boys to his bed, pretend like he was playing a movie for them on his laptop, and he was actually playing, um, um, what's it called? Uh, X-rated movies for them on his laptop and telling them to touch him on his body. And so it was, it was really disheartening for us to hear that. I mean, by the time we got the guy arrested and all that, and he was telling his own story, the boy too had been molested. The, that's the guy from Abuja, had been molested by an uncle. And so you find out that, like Dr. Sheng said, if these things are not, um, if we don't create an environment that helps people to speak out and get help, it just becomes a vicious cycle that repeats itself, especially amongst boys who seem to have been taught or been built to hold things in and keep things to themselves and not share with people around them. So okay. building an environment that encourages people to speak out is actually key to dealing with gender-based violence in our communities. All right. Uh, thank you so much for that. 
So um, um, before we end the conversation, I'd like Dr. Adiwumi to talk about the issue of prosecution. Perpetrators of gender-based violence have always been prosecuted, have been arrested. Some of them get, have, seen, have, seen, have uh, followed cases of where people that are accused get uh, um, exonerated mm -hmm. after paying some money to some people, some judges and all that. I've seen such cases before. So what is your evaluation of prosecution of gender-based violence in Nigeria. Okay, truth is, I really don't know much about that. I feel like Dr. Adebayo would have a better answer. But what I would just like to say is that coming from the angle of, um, I'm not sure, I don't want to digress, but coming from the angle of, if I'm going to ask myself, who are these perpetrators? How can we identify the perpetrators and how can we put them in whatever they might and wherever they might be from? What caused them to do what they did in the first place? There are a lot of examples of what might have caused them. It might be the fact that okay, culture, like what culture has trained has taught them to, to be. It might be the fact that okay, drug use, maybe he, um, he or she used um some um abused some substances as regards drugs. And then one way or the other can't, couldn't control himself. It could be that it could be a mental disorder as regards um, psychopathic disorder and a lot of other things. So ask if you're going to, if I'm going to ask myself, who are these perpetrators and why are they perpetrators? What caused them to be able to do what they did? Then I feel like um, that should be the, 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 the I don't, should I say punishment now? But punishment according to the court, like the punishment should be attached to the cause. So what I've learned over time is that um, when when a perpetrator is punished, and punishment punish doesn't mean using a cane to flog or, to, um, or throwing stones at the person. What I mean by punishing is um, more of justice. So a perpetrator is arrested, put in the cell. Even while the perpetrator is in the cell, the perpetrator can go through psychosocial support in a way to train the perpetrator on, okay, what you should do, what you shouldn't do, why you did this and why you shouldn't do this, what you might have cost to yourself, why, what you might have, might have cost to another person. So I feel like in the long run, justice should be served, whether the perpetrator um, an influential person or not, so that these things can encourage people to be able to speak out. Because if I know that uh, me speaking out will mean that I, I, I will get the justice I want. I will obviously be encouraged to speak out, even if it takes time, but I'll be encouraged to speak out. When, but when I know that, even if I speak out, I, won't, I might not get the justice I want, then I, I, I might not speak out. But when it now comes to the rudiments of the old, um, 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 maybe arresting the perpetrator and so on, I, I really don't know much about that. I feel like Dr. Nibayo has um, All right. two things to say. Um, thank you so much for that. So before we end the conversation, you've, you've both emphasized the need for parents to get to get taught on uh, sex education and so, so they will know how to teach their children. So how can parents? Uh, I don't think you. Talk, I don't. I didn't get whether I, I'm not sure you talk touch really on that on how parents. What what can parents do in teaching sex education? So I would like Dr. Adibaya to answer that question. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, in addition to what Dr. Shil uh, had said earlier, I'd say that one of the issues with um, prosecuting perpetrators has actually mostly been um, community, societal, cultural issues. So you find that a lot of times the state has decided to uh, prosecute someone or an organization has said to prosecute someone who has uh, perpetrated a sexual violence against someone, but the family did, because most times, I mean, from studies, we know that people who perpetrate this violence are family members, mostly. I mean, 80%, 70 to 80% of the time, the people that perpetrate violence are family members. So people will say, oh, because it's our family, we will settle this thing within the family. We don't want it to go to court. We don't want it to have to do with a judge and all that. So a lot of times, this some of these cases even die a natural death before they get to the courtroom. And some that even make it to the courtroom due to several situations. I mean, sometimes there is bribe involved. Sometimes, and, and I mean bribe to the family, 
the family may withdraw the case. And when the family withdraw the case, there's almost nothing the prosecutor can do. And there are several issues bordering corruption also within our legal system. And we know that um, that's, the corruption is widespread across several other issues and several other areas of, um, of our lives. But then the, I think the major issue with prosecution in a lot of times has to do with our culture and sentiments from the parents of victims, especially when it comes to young people and adolescents. To talk about how parents can help um, uh, sexual education amongst the adolescents, I, I think we'll start from even having a relationship with your child. You, you cannot just wake up when your child is 15 or when your child is 12 and you start wanting to talk to the child about sex. It's going to be very awkward for you and the child. I mean, you've you hardly ever talked to the child about school. You've ever hardly ever talked to the child about their dreams. And then the next day, you're calling them to sit down and talk to them about sex. It's going to be awkward. That child is not going to talk back to you. They're not going to say their minds to you. They're not going to tell you what's really happening in their minds. So my first advice to parents would be develop a relationship with your child as early as possible. If you have a good relationship with your child, every other thing is likely to flow naturally from that. Then when we talk about... Um, um, sexuality education, I mean, there are several mater materials online that you can use. In fact, the FLHE curriculum that we teach in school is available online. There are several other curriculums that parents can use to, um, to educate their children about sexual, about sexual issues and reproductive health issues. And all these curriculum are free and available online. But even if you have the curriculum and you don't have a relationship with that child, it becomes impossible to converse at that level. So the first thing is have a relationship with your child as early as possible and then get help. There are online courses, there are online curriculums that you can use to um, talk to your child. And also, I mean, sometimes um, using other parents, the experience of other parents to deal with your own child also helps. You have an older parent around you who has um, successfully raised their own children. Talk to them. How do they deal with issues of sex? How do they help their children um, go through the age of puberty and uh, adolescence. So what did you do? Ask questions like that, and you will find out that it also helps to um, help. It also helps you to raise your child and help them to get through sexual and reproductive health issues during puberty. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Adebay and Dr. Madewumi. Before we just before we end the conversation, I would like you to give us a closing remarks with regards to the issue of of using sex education to eliminate um, gender-based violence. Starting with Dr. Adewumi. I am. Go ahead. Hello. Um, I wrote something down that actually answers that, so I just just trying to find it to just read it out. Yes. Yeah, so, um, when sexual education is effective, it means that. You are addressing balance. What balance are you trying to address? You are trying to express the fact that the more you know, the more we all know, the more we are educated when it comes to sex education, the less we are vulnerable to coercion, the less we are vulnerable to abuse, the less we are vulnerable to exploitation. And examples of such things that should be focused on when it comes to sex education is emotional relations and responsibilities, human sexual anatomy, sexual activity, sexual reproduction, age of consent, which is very important, uh, reproductive health and rights, safe sex, birth control, sexual abstinence. abstinence. So um, one thing I would say is that with all the things we've talked about today, we can actually agree and see the fact that to actually curb um, gender-based violence, sex education actually plays a very huge role. All right. Thank you so much for that. And um, Dr. Adebayo. Um, I'd like to start by saying that um, uh, that we current from, I have it on good authority that the organizations currently um, trying to expand the FLHE curriculum to um, include gender issues, um, to become gender sensitive. And they are piloting some of these 
uh, curry. They have piloted some of these issues in different states within the country. So I, I believe that within a year, we should have a curriculum that has been scaled up to national level that will become more gender sensitive. And I feel like that's a very good thing. And secondly, um, the, the issue is most of our implementation at this level are um, NGO driven. It's, uh, they are NGO driven, um, partner driven. If for us to really own this process, some of these things have to be government driven. If they are government driven, we are better able to manage, we're better able to understand, we're better able to implement, and it is be, it's more sustainable. So I would say that government needs to take more ownership in implementing a lot of uh, our programs, including sexuality education within the country. And then I'll say at the media level, the media plays a very huge role in providing information to people across the country. And media, not just social media, not just radio and TV, but even movies and music, they're all also different forms of media. All these things have roles to play in the perpetration of gender-based violence. For example, if the movies I watch, in every movie I watch, the men are always beating their women. It becomes, it looks like it is a normal thing that happens. It's a normal thing that should happen. I mean, but we need to begin to use all this medium as an opportunity. For example, this kind of talk we are having right now, it's a good one and it's a laudable one. I really um, appreciate Edu Salem for coming up with this program. We need to begin to do more things like this. We are engaging the community with information, with um, um, with data, with different things that can help the, com the community have better understanding and uh, thereby changing their knowledge, changing their perception, and changing their practice towards gender-based violence issues. For example, I mean, the, the fact that we have so much publicity about gender-based violence these days is because of media. Media has played a very key role to this. First of all, there was education, but then where education stops, the media takes up. So I'll say that every single sector has a role to play. And if every role, every sector, including the family sector, community sector, religious sector, and individuals, if all of us will do what we need to do, we can kick GBV out of the country. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. So if, um, for, for the past uh, one hour, for the one, past one hour and um, 15 minutes, we've been joined by Dr. Emmanuel Adibayo of the College of Medicine, University of Ibadan, and Dr. Oluwa Shewun Adewumi of the Stand, Stand to End Rape Initiative in Lagos. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, we hope that the conversation we've had, uh, which has talked about various issues in addition to sex education, gender-based violence, its preventive measures, and various ways in which various stakeholders can provide support mechanisms in order to eliminate this um, heinous crime in the society. We hope that in the nearest future, we'll be able to achieve some of the things, some of the um, suggestions highlighted here and to help our nation in the nearest future. Thank you very much for joining us, um, um, Dr. Adiba and Dr. Adewumi. So, um, and we hope to see you some other time. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. It is now compulsory to wear a face mask whenever you are out in public. Here are some additional information for wearing face masks so you protect yourself and your loved ones. For your cloth mask, make sure you wash, dry and iron even before first use. Wear your mask as you leave the house. Do not pull the mask down onto your chin. You can speak, cough or sneeze inside a mask. Do not throw a used mask around carelessly and remove from children's reach. If you don't live alone in a house, ensure that everyone keeps their face mask properly and can identify their masks. Your face mask is your personal property. Do not share. Wearing the face mask may feel strange and uncomfortable, but remember that it is better to protect yourself than expose yourself and loved ones to catching the virus. Wearing face masks alone do not protect you from contracting COVID-19. Practice physical distancing and wash your hands regularly with soap and water. Take responsibility. Do not share face masks. This message is from the Federal and State Ministries of Health, Ministry of Information, NCDC, and Partners.